Philadelphia 76ers select Markel Fultz from the University of Washington. That's a bad look at free throw right there. I, I hate to be the one to, to say this, but you know, he's been a bust for, for them. This is the most bizarre thing we've ever seen from a number one overall pick in the draft. Right now, it appears to be the biggest bust in NBA history. In high school there, Fultz. Listen to the crowd. Listen to the reaction. Well, they're getting on their feet. You've seen the moment late in the second quarter where Fultz was about to check back in, but the Sixers went with McConnell instead. Psychologically, something very bad has happened to this kid. In all my years of watching the NBA, no story of a player has ever stuck with me like Markel Fultz's has. There's so many theories regarding what happened and how it transpired, so many layers that extend past his basketball life and into his personal life. Markel was drafted into what seemed like an excellent situation, surrounded by two of the best youngest players in the league, the chances of failing seemed so incredibly minuscule. The way he failed is a combination of mismanagement, unlucky events, and the unfortunate pressure of being drafted with the top pick. There's no definitive moment in the entirety of Fultz's saga that you can point to and say this is where it all went wrong. However, you can notice small details here and there that snowballed over time until it was too late. The shoulder injury may have taken the attention, but they won't tell you the full story. That's where I come in. This is the real story about the rise and fall of Markel Fultz. Fultz was a five-star prospect at DeMatha Academy, one of the best high schools for athletes. What many don't remember about this time is that just two years previously, Fultz was cut from his sophomore team. He took this personally and worked even harder on his skills, eventually making it to the varsity team. He then dominated, took over the high school scene, and asserted himself as one of the best players in the nation. Markel had plenty of accomplishments at such a young age, so the choices for college seemed widespread, with many big names on the horizon. Despite this, he ended up choosing Washington University, a school that's known for having many former NBA players like Isaiah Thomas, DeJounte Murray, and Brandon Roy. What's interesting to note is that all of these players weren't the best in their class. Roy was the sixth pick in the 2006 draft, DeJounte was a late first rounder, and Isaiah was the last pick. Why not choose a more popular school? Fellow guards of that draft class like De'Aaron Fox and Lonzo Ball chose Kentucky and UCLA, which were much more known and successful. What gives? To Markel, when he entered the gym, it was simply love at first sight, and Washington offered him a contract months before the other schools. That's understandable, but also thought-provoking. The top player in the nation chose a school that hadn't qualified for the NCAA tournament in six years. Nonetheless, Kell arrived as a Washington Husky and burst onto the scene. His skill set as a guard was unmatched. He could be an excellent playmaker, but also create shots for himself off the dribble. He was a terrific finisher with poster dunks and flashy layups every night. And perhaps the most coveted aspect of his game was his effortless sharpshooting. He could rise up over any defender, pull up from 30 and hear the net swish. Fultz could do everything as a point guard offensively. His defense, however, was often criticized as lackadaisical. Yet with him standing at 6 feet 4 inches, there was a perfectly good reason to assume he'd develop a strong defensive game at the next level. What's important to highlight is that at this time, in every single mock draft, Fultz was at the top. Not top point guard, top player overall. It's easy to look back now with revisionist history and make the bold claim that Jason Tatum should have gone first overall, 
but evidence from 2017 shows otherwise. The Washington Huskies went 9-22, and not even cracking the tournament, and all eyes went to the man himself regarding this. If he was so good, then how come his team lost so much? Fultz fans pointed out that the roster itself lacked talent, which is true, and the basketball world paid no mind to this losing record because the 2017 draft was fastly approaching. The 2017 draft lottery took place with the Boston Celtics landing the top slot. They kept this pick for about a month when suddenly, out of nowhere, they traded down with the Sixers, receiving the third pick as Philly stepped up to one. Fans immediately began criticizing Boston general manager Danny Ainge for making such a decision. How could you pass up the opportunity to draft what seemed like the perfect guard? Looking back, we truly don't know why the Celtics made this decision. They could have just been that infatuated with Jason Tatum, the offensively polished forward from Duke. Either that, or they could have seen something wrong with Markel Fultz. He struggled badly in his workout with the C's. His shot form looked fine, but the end result was a clank off the rim. Other fans love pointing to Fultz's free throw percentage as a reason that we should have been concerned, but that's also pure revisionist history. They claim the true way to determine if somebody is a shooter is by their free throws, which I agree with. However, when Fultz arrives in the league, it's not that he couldn't make threes, but that he was physically incapable of shooting jump shots at all. We'll never know for sure why Boston skipped on Markel, and all of the media attention soon went to Philly, as they had a chance to form a dynasty. Fultz, Simmons, Embiid. Two number one picks and one third pick who had shown flashes of greatness. Markel had another terrible workout with Philly just a few days before the draft, but now it was far too late to think anything of that. You'd already given up the assets to get here. Fultz's trainer excused this by simply saying the kid was nervous, which made sense at the time. Reminder, it's easy to say now that these were red flags, but it makes no sense to skip on the best prospect in the class because of a few bad workouts. Philly chose him with the first pick a few days later, and the NBA world exploded into excitement. As Markel walked towards the stage, in his big moment, a few interesting words were uttered by Reese Davis, the ESPN draft analyst. List. An avid BMX biker, and now he, he loves to throw caution to the wind. And Did you catch that? An avid BMX biker. An avid BMX biker. This sentence is often referenced by many when the question of what happened arises. The theory goes as followed. Fultz, being a big fan of biking, injured his shoulder and refused to tell the Sixers organization so his contract wouldn't be voided. I find this theory to be incorrect. Had this motor accident been the case, structural damage would have been found in Fultz's shoulder. However, the Sixers stated multiple times that this wasn't the case, and there wasn't anything damaged in his shoulder. That fact in itself crumbles this theory to pieces. In other news, Jason Tatum, the player Philly essentially traded Fultz for, talked in his draft interview. He said that Boston would have taken him with the number one pick had they not traded down. Immediately, Sixers and NBA fans alike mocked this statement because at the time, it sounded ludicrous. This once again puts into question why did Danny Ainge feel so strongly about skipping on Fultz? Fast forward to Summer League. The first game on the board was Sixers versus Celtics, Fultz versus Tatum, and fans were excited. The two young guns battled it out. Fultz hit flashy shots. Tatum threw down dunks. It was looking like a future rivalry was setting itself in stone. Jason Tatum, however, got the last laugh, hitting a long jumper to win the game. Overall, Markel played well, but was inefficient. He was sloppy and turned it over quite a bit, although that was expected from a young player in his first ever game. On the other hand, Markel looked poised with many jumpers, hitting this smooth mid-range J, or has he pull up Jimbo as as Kevin Durant tweeted. The defense was fantastic as well. The blocked shots by Markel were highlight worthy, showing the elite defensive potential. In all of those great moments, however, the first domino in the Fultz saga began to fall. 
Take a look at the jump shot in these clips. Not bad looking at all, but different from the form he had at Washington. Much lower and not the same high release point as before. The next game against the Jazz, he continued to play well, dropping 23 points with a flurry of more jump shots. The form was still visibly different than his college one, but since they were going in, nobody seemed to notice. His third summer league game was when the next domino fell. Against the Warriors, Fultz was incredibly aggressive in the paint, driving every single time. Then, as he went up for a block, he came down hard and injured his ankle, thus sidelining him for the rest of Summer League. Injuries happen, and this specific ankle wasn't some sort of a threat to his health at all. The real problem here is that by sustaining this injury, he was no longer playing, and the Sixers as a team wouldn't be able to fully monitor him until the season began a few months later. In between this period of the Summer League injury and the impending season, something went horribly wrong for Markel Fultz. Throughout his time in a Sixers uniform so far, his form visually seemed fine, but he wasn't taking as many jump shots as when he was in college. In fact, that final game against the Warriors saw him only shooting one jumper, a moving mid-range bucket. These shooting and jump shot issues didn't begin after the ankle injury, but before it quite possibly during the draft. There were many rumors supporting the idea that he never wanted to come to Philly in the first place, so when he heard the news of the Sixers moving up to draft him, that could have been a tough pill to swallow. Tanking to the top by Yaron Weitzman adds more ammo to the mental hurdles Markel had to go through. He had a fight with his mother, then went to the gym and his form looked horrendous. Lloyd Pierce, the Sixers' assistant coach at the time, worked with Fultz on an off day after Summer League had closed. I've never seen anything like that before, Pierce said to colleagues after the workout. This kid can't shoot. None of this had made the news though. Nobody really knew about Fultz's problems, so he went to the only person he trusted with basketball, his longtime trainer, Keith Williams. Keith had been training Fultz for years, so when Markel came to him and said that he believed somebody was holding down his arms as he was lifting to shoot, they tried multiple practices to fix this issue, one of which was him shooting while lying on the gym floor, or dribbling the ball into his shot to create a rhythm. We don't know what effect this training had on Fultz or his shot but it certainly wasn't positive. October 18th, 2017 was the first game of Markel Fultz's pro career, and it was a complete mess. Don't get me wrong, he showed flashes with his finishing ability and defense, but it seemed like throughout it all, he was a shadow of his former self. Once again, the lack of jump shots was present. He shot one the entire game. This off-balance mid-range two-pointer looked great actually, and gave Sixers fans hope that Markel could eventually return to his old ways. We now know that Fultz has always been better with moving off-balance shots. The precise reason for this is undetermined, but it's a mix of him not thinking while shooting and it just being a more comfortable shot. And perhaps the worst moment of the game, Fultz was fouled, driving inside, and shot two of the worst free throws I've ever seen in my life. It's easy for any bystander to look at this moment and laugh at a professional basketball player having the shot of a child, but just think about it for a moment. This was a 19-year-old rookie, someone who was selected number one overall, with monumental expectations of being the finishing piece for a franchise. A guy who was an absolute sharpshooter just a few months ago, for whatever reason, is unable to lift up his shoulders, and is still voluntarily playing games to try and help his team. This pattern of shooting woes continued for a few more games, until Fultz was yanked from the team and listed as out for the foreseeable future. The Sixers said he had scapular muscle imbalance, which is a fancy way for saying his shoulder just wasn't right. There was also word from his agent, Raymond Brothers, that Fultz had fluid taken out of his shoulder. This was then changed to having fluid put in his shoulder. There seemed to be no understanding of what was going on. With all of this happening, the Sixers general manager, Brian Colangelo, said that there was nothing wrong physically with Fultz. For the next five months, it was complete radio silence. Fultz quietly 
badly trained and retooled his jump shot because now he lacked the strength to shoot from a few feet away. There were moments in the recovery process where NBA media members forgot he was human, to the point where fellow veteran teammate JJ Redick had to explicitly tell them to leave Fultz alone. First, thank you for that. You know, that was like a another big, big brother moment that you, you know, you stuck, stood up for me and it made me feel even better. Other basketball media began to hop on the Fultz criticism as well, some jumping to calling him a bust already. Throughout all of this, Fultz maintained that what was going on was an injury. His rookie season at this point was a complete disaster, five games played, and it seemed like he never get the chance to show what he was capable of. That was the case until in late March of 2018, when Markel went to the head coach at the time, Brett Brown, and told him, I'm ready. Markel Fultz will play tonight. Uh, it was his decision. I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous what what he's been through and he understands it and I understand it, you know, that's the, the scrutiny you get when somebody says, and with the first pick of the 2017 NBA draft, the Philadelphia 76ers select Markel Fultz. Markel Fultz will play tonight. Those were the words that rang across the NBA world. It was five months of absolute disaster, confusion, lost hope. Yet, in just a normal regular season game against the Denver Nuggets, Fultz would suddenly be returning. In his first game back, he dropped 10 points and 8 assists. Once the game slowed down, you could see the potential begin to show. Hard drives to the rim, clever passes, and a smooth mid-range game. The only issue is that with this return, there were no 3-point attempts, as well as no free throws. Those were the two biggest issues, and it seemed like they weren't being fixed. Anyone who brought this up, however, was quickly silenced, because most were happy Fultz was playing at all. Philly ended up winning their last 9 games of the season. Markel played okay, but there still weren't any 3-pointers, and the free throw was still broken. Many were rightfully confused at why the same issues were still here five months later, but just shrugged their shoulders and hoped it would be fixed with time. In the last game of the 2017-18 season, Fultz posted the youngest triple-double in NBA history with 12 points, 10 assists, and 10 rebounds. An overall solid game that showed he could play well, even without a jump shot. At the end, when he grabbed his 10th board, he was mobbed by his teammates, showing how much they believed in the kid. It was a great thing to see. Fast forward to the playoffs, and Fultz barely plays, getting DNPs in the second round series versus Boston. The reason for this varied on who you asked. Philly claimed it was because Fultz needed more time before playing in the postseason, and others said it was because Fultz just wasn't good enough. The series against the Celtics had to be one of the most mentally challenging events a rookie could ever go through. Seeing Jason Tatum, the guy who was traded for you, drop bucket after bucket to eliminate your team as you could do nothing but sit and watch, it was tough. As the Sixers lost 4-1, there was disappointment, but hope in the air. It was a wild season, so the offseason could be a time for everything to slow down and let Fultz recover to his full abilities. Remember, just 12 months ago, he was the top prospect in the nation. What if all he needed was some time to rest and recoup? Fultz and Joel Embiid discussed off-season training plans, and Embiid recommended Drew Hanlon as a trainer. Hanlon is known for training some of the best players in the game, and with his ever-so-popular social media presence, hype was on the way in Fultz Town. Over the summer, Hanlon released videos of Markel working out, not showing any videos of the form, but promising that he'd turn him into an all-star. Embiid and Simmons were great and all, but none of this will work out unless Fultz truly develops into the player they hope he can become. Fast forward to the 2018-19 season, Markel talks about his renewed confidence, how the summer was one of his hardest working, and that he was ready to become the third star. In the preseason, Fultz looked okay. 
okay. His mid-range shot looked pure, which was reassuring. Plus, his finishing and playmaking was solid. He did make one three-pointer, the first of his NBA career, a corner wide-open triple. The form looked not bad, a little on the slow side, but much better than the disaster that was his rookie season. The only issue is that, once again, the shot was nothing like his college one. The form was slow and had a lower release point. Is this really a shot that he could shoot 40% from three with, like he did in college? The 2018-19 season began with monolithic expectations for Markel. It was time to show that untapped potential and that new shooting. It all started in Boston, TD Garden, a rematch of last season's playoff series and Philly's chance to get revenge. Unfortunately, Boston blew the Sixers out. Tatum shined and Fultz was invisible. He scored 5 points total, 2 of 7 from the field, and 1 jump shot which was an off-balance 2-pointer. This is when fans really began to get upset. How is it that after all of this time, Markel still couldn't shoot any threes? Philly started out the season 8-5, and five, Fultz looking mediocre with little to no three-pointers. He also made headlines for his wacky free throw forms, the infamous double pump, as well as whatever this is, was worrying. The Sixers weren't impressed, and by now they had run out of patience. They soon traded for all-star forward Jimmy Butler, which yanked Markel out of the starting lineup and onto the bench. November 19th, 2018 was Fultz's last game with the Sixers. His agent announced that they'd be looking for a shoulder specialist to diagnose an injury, and Markel was out indefinitely. This was the second straight year that he'd played for a few games, then get pulled out before he had a chance to truly get his feet wet in the game of basketball. The weird part about all of this is that Fultz was hitting mid-range shots at a solid clip. There were some games when he hit multiple 15-footers, so why couldn't that translate to three-pointers? Right after the Suns game, Fultz talked with Allen Iverson. You gotta wonder if AI told him to trust his body and sit out. A few weeks later, he was diagnosed with thoracic out syndrome. It's a condition that affects the shoulder. Some were skeptical as they believed Fultz's team made up this injury to mask the fact he simply forgot how to shoot. Others were happy that his injury was finally diagnosed and that he could begin his recovery process. The trade deadline arrived and Fultz was shipped out to the Orlando Magic for Jonathan Simmons and a heavily protected first round pick. Philly was all in for a title run with their big four. They didn't have time to wait for Markel to get better. For Fultz, Orlando seemed like a good spot, a team with much less media attention, who didn't have championship hopes. Hopefully here, he can return to his number one pick self. This trade represents the failure of what could have been. Fultz, Embiid, and Simmons were expected to be one of the best big threes the league had to offer. And instead, for whatever mysterious shoulder-related issue, it just couldn't come to fruition. The Sixers have never been the same. For years, they've lacked a shot-creating guard to lead their team. Markel was supposed to be that guy and didn't pan out. Once he arrived in Orlando, Markel began working with the Magic staff to get healthy. He didn't play for the rest of the 2018-19 season, meaning he played 33 games total with the Sixers. 33. He never really got a fair chance to showcase his skills of why he was the number one pick, and just as quickly as he was in Philly, he was out. Fultz made his Magic debut on October 23rd, 2019. He hit a few mid-range shots and threw down a vicious slam. The three-pointer, after two and a half years, still remained a non-factor. At this point, fans just focused on other aspects of his game, no point in dwelling on the jump shot. Throughout the season, Fultz showed flashes, whether it was going toe-to-toe -to -toe with LeBron James down the stretch, throwing down poster dunks in transition, or simply staying healthy, Markel impressed many with his play and averaged career-best numbers. 12 points a night on 47% shooting, 
five assists and five rebounds per contest with elite finishing, disciplined defense, and great mid-range shooting. He shot an ugly 26% from downtown. The only difference between Orlando and Philly was the fact that he simply attempted more threes. He was no longer hesitating, as he once did. When he caught it beyond the perimeter, he fired away. The weirdest part is that he was so damn good shooting mid-range shots. There were times when he would light up an opposing team with just jumpers. His free throws were vastly improved as well. Gone were the days of the double pump. Fultz shot 73% from the line, which was right around the league average, and the form looked much more consistent. Fast forward to the bubble, and the 8th seed and Magic squared off against the Bucks. Game 1 was unforgettable, because Orlando shocked Milwaukee, absolutely dominating them, with Fultz putting up 15 points. It finally felt like he was a part of a team, a culture. He was the quarterback to this upset victory. They ended up losing in 5 but Fultz played well in his first ever real playoff series. The narrative now surrounding Markel is simple. He's a fine player without a three-point shot, a high-level bench player slash low-level starter. If he really wants to live up to that number one hype, however, he must gain an outside shot to become an all-star. The 2020-21 season began, and Fultz immediately went to work, averaging 20 points per game on high efficiency, destroying the Washington Wizards and looking like a star in the making. He had no three-point shot, but it didn't look like he needed one. Down the stretch, he simply bulldozed the defense out of the way. Just a few games later, his knee collapsed and he tore his ACL. The Magic were 6-2, number one in the East before he went down. Fultz had shown tons of progress, yet in the core of this success, we forgot about why we hadn't seen this progress in so long injuries. It was heartbreaking, and he's been recovering since January. This puts his future in a bit of a question mark. It's clear the talent is there, but he hasn't been healthy nearly as much as he should be to showcase what he's capable of. His game still has one glaring weakness, which is the lack of a three-point shot, and if he never develops that essential skill, he'll never reach the all-star potential he's capable of. As for my theory regarding Markel, I think it was a mix of injury and mental pressure. Somewhere along the line, he must have developed some shoulder issues, which then added a hitch to his shot. Instead of resting and waiting, he tried to play through it, thus developing a lack of confidence in his shooting ability. Once that shoulder issue went away, the mental block remained, and he has since not been able to get over it. He also lacks the strength shooting the ball from behind the perimeter. From 15 feet, the form looks beautiful. From 22 feet, it looks like he needs more oomph. He's also good at shooting off the dribble, which requires less thinking when putting the ball up compared to standstill. We can sit here and theorize all we want, but no one really knows what happened besides Fultz himself, and he said it was an injury, so let's believe him. The Markel Fultz saga is truly one of the most heartbreaking stories the NBA has ever seen. One of the most hyped up prospects in years went from a surefire all-star compared to James Harden to forgotten by many in Orlando. There's still a real chance he blossoms into a star player. Someone with as much talent as he possesses will always stick around, but it all resides on him developing a perimeter game. You can watch the NBA for the rest of your life, and you'll never see a story like Fultz's ever transpire again. It's now up to him to make that story have a good ending.